Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week we delve into the health of Minnesota's pension plans with the current and former chairs of the Pension Commission. We also get an up-close look at the most popular feature of the state capitol. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program, I'm Shannon Lurkey. Necessary adjustments to Minnesota's pension plans have failed to become law over the past two years. That combined with market swings and new accounting estimates have produced some provocative headlines. Joining me in the studio to discuss the health of Minnesota's pension plans is the chair of the Legislative Commission on Pensions and Retirement, Senator Julie Rosen. Welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Bloomberg's calculations, which were released in late August, caused a bit of a stir. They indicated that the state funding is at only 53% of its liability, down from 80% the previous year. Did this report alarm you? Well, the report alarmed me. It was a little misleading, too, because they go actually by accounting standards, and we go by actuarial standards. And so it was comparing apples and oranges, and you can't really do that. Uh, we are moving in the right direction with our pension reform. We had a very strong bill last year that was voted off the floor 67 to 0. And I can tell you that is unheard of for a pension reform bill to have uh, that strong of a bipartisan support ongoing. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was uh, unilateral. Every, everyone approved it. And part of that bill uh, was shared responsibility between current employees to fund in and also cutting the cost of living adjustment for the retirees just to kind of balance the needs of the plan. Is this going to be the viable option going forward? Will you continue to work for that kind of solution? Absolutely. And I think what's important here is, and I want to shout a big shout out to the plans and their boards. They came around the table and we worked diligently all last, um, well, starting in November, of course, and um, all the way through session to get a reform package, a pension reform package that the whole legislature could support. So there is shared sacrifice in that pension bill. And we also looked at ongoing reform and really drilled down to what, what the, the plans were providing. And we found some things such as augmentation, which is uh, a 2% automatic increase on the pension after you retire. We didn't know about that. So there was some adjustments on some early, ref some other reform packages that the plans agreed to. It's very important to have everybody at the table working on these reforms. This wasn't something that the commission just developed and we hammered the pensions to accept. They were there, they accepted it, maybe begrudgingly some of these, but it is shared sacrifice. So pension bills have been vetoed for the last two years. Uh, last year because uh, the bill was linked to a controversial labor provision. Will it be a priority this year? Is time running out to get these changes in place for the future? Well, I, I hate to say that the time is running out, but it's extremely important to get these changes in place. We did have a return of investment on 15.1 percent this year. So it's increasing, this, the, the funds are a little more stable, but that doesn't mean we're going to backpedal on the reforms that we already put in place or that we're instigating and that we already got agreement on and that the legislature voted on. If there's any changes to the reform bill, we could start losing some, some votes, and that's critical. So it's extremely important to get these reforms in place and stabilize these funds to at least 90 percent, and that's the goal. 90 percent is the goal in terms of ongoing 100 percent is the goal, right? But we but would love 90 percent would be 90. great. <laughs> um, there was a recent pension commission meeting. What was your takeaway from that? Well, the takeaway on that was basically to, to tee it up, to talk about how the plans were doing, what had been tra transpired, because we put them to work over the summer too, um, and we want to see how the boards are feeling and if they were thinking of any adjustments to the reform bill from last year. We also got a, uh, a really good discussion from the SBI director and uh, the 15.1% investment and his overview of that. And we wanted to see how he felt about the, the rate of return, the 7.5% um, the rate of return that we are adamant about. The same right. rate of return. It was at 8.5%, but the, the plan in the future is to adjust it down to an annual return of 75 Exactly. Like that's a little bit safer for the future? Exactly. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Is the idea, this is, this is kind of a philosophical question, but is the idea of a defined benefit plan archaic and in need of phasing out, or is it important to keep these pension plans in place for the types of workers who receive them? Oh, it's very important to keep these plans in place. That's a commitment we made from the state, and it's a commitment to these workers and their spouses to keep these plans in place. Uh, we have studied this f for many years. As long as, as I've been on it, it's going on nine years, I suppose. And we've looked at going through a defined contribution, extremely expensive, billions of dollars. And that's very controversial, too. Is that accurate? But uh, when you talk to the State Board of Investment, they believe a, st uh, a defined benefit plan is doable as long as there is shared sacrifice. And I think we are working towards that direction in this reform package. So our commitment, my commitment as the Pension Commission chair is to make sure that we keep these, these funds viable and ongoing and get them fully funded as, as much as possible. Now, before we started taping, you talked about balancing so many of these interests and how it's really like a puzzle. With this wave of baby boom retirements and then the generations that will follow, are you confident that this, is, this can be figured out? Yes, I am confident. And we have an extremely good pension commission. Uh, it's very exciting once you get the, the, the mechanics of pensions. It's extremely... Uh, I love it, <laughs> and it's uh, and you have to be very careful how you handle pension um, these these benefits and the plans, and you can't over over um, prescribe or over give too many benefits. So it's a moving puzzle, but you have to keep it very very simple too. So ongoing, I think we can. We had the money last year to make sure that we could get at least MSRS, Para, and St. Paul Teachers to that 90% funded. Uh, TRA was, um, we were working and with that's them. the teachers retirement. Right, the teachers. And we're working with them, and we, uh, I think we have them convinced to go to the same rate of return to 7.5 and not go back up to their 8.0 that they wanted to go along with the other plans. And um, we, we're going to work very hard this year to get it done. There is a strong appetite, at least in the Senate, to make sure that we get this pension bill done. Is it important to you that this pension bill be done cleanly so that it can have that unilateral support again? Absolutely. Um, I was, I was, I, I'll be honest, I was disappointed that the pension bill and the preemption bill uh, combined was the only bill that was vetoed by the governor. And the year before, um, we're not quite sure why he vetoed the, the pension bill, except there was some uh, disagreement from, I think, the teachers, the TRA. And this is good, it's going to be three years ongoing, and there are individual pension problems that for individuals that are getting some readjustment. We need to get a pension bill signed by the governor, and this is the year to do it. And we are starting early. We have the commitment. Um, I feel like we've got the, the money, at least for the, the three funds, squirreled away, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll continue to work with the, the Teachers Retirement Association. Senator Rosen, it's so nice to have you here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Shannon. It's really good to be here, finally. This week at the Capitol, Commerce Commissioner Mike Rothman announced how the state's health reinsurance plan has stabilized rates for the roughly 263,000 Minnesotans who purchase coverage in the individual market. A Commerce Department analysis found that just 2.2% of enrollees account for about half of total claim costs in the entire individual market. To address this challenge, reinsurance provides a financial backstop against these high cost claims and thereby reduces premiums for all consumers in the individual market. We estimate that reinsurance is reducing premiums for 2018 by an average of 20% from what they would otherwise be. And in the Capitol Rotunda, lawmakers and people with ties to Puerto Rico came together to call for immediate public and private aid for the island in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. As you know, uh, there are 3.5 million American citizens in the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. And today marks the 12th day of this hurricane devastating the island, literally shredding the infrastructure to its decimating the infrastructure. Water and electricity are still uh, lacking in Puerto Rico. And today we, we want to make sure that Americans know and our country does what it has to do 
to unite efforts with our congressional leaders, with our state leaders, and with our local leaders. Uh, we're Minnesotans, we're Americans, and we care. Um, I want to say very quickly that this is a very, very unusual situation. Every hurricane, every damage that we've had in this nation is unique and terrible with a, with a huge cost of life and property and psychology and spirit. And each one merits the responses that we've done as a people to walk with our fellow Americans. We need to do the same thing in Puerto Rico. And we need to understand the incredible, incredible, I cannot overstate the incredible damage that exist on that island right now. As we speak, there are communities in the hills that have been physically isolated since the hurricane. No aid has gotten there since the hurricane. We're talking basic food and water, basic ability to communicate. So there's a lot of good things that are happening on the ground, but we need to step up even bigger. That's gonna require a larger response from the federal government right now and it's going to require a big aid package on the part of Congress and the White House in the coming weeks. I just don't know that we've seen this before. Americans within our own territory, slowly exterminated by starvation and thirst and darkness descending upon millions within our American family while we sit within reach and do not stand or extend our arms. And I have to say, what does it say of this, our greatest republic, when we allow that to happen? When did we become this weak or this small-hearted? We are not this small. We are not this small-hearted. No matter if our own leaders tell us we are, we know that what made America great and what makes it great today is the goodness of its soul, the ingenuity of its endeavors, and the intensity of its labors for what is right. And so I encourage our leaders at all levels of the executive branch and, and federal government to do what Americans have always done in this situation and help our friends and neighbors in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is an island that is 100 miles by 35 miles long. I find it unfathomable that there would not have been a plan in place and that we can say that a country that has engaged in wars across the world, that this would be the most challenging logistically event ever in this country is astounding to me. As Latinos in Minnesota, as Minnesotanos, as Minnesotans, we know the value of depending on our extended familias and the trust that each we will reach out and come together in this time of need. MCLA has received calls and information regarding relief and assist, assistant efforts and will do our best to connect individuals with organizations that are doing great work to support the people of Puerto Rico. My next guest has over 10 years experience on the Legislative Commission on Pensions and Retirement. Senator Sandy Pappas now joins me in the studio to offer her perspective on the health of Minnesota's public pension plans. Welcome. Thank you. The recent sky is falling news from Bloomberg said in late August that Minnesota's pension plans are funded at 53% of what is needed for future obligations, down from 80% last year. They also said that pension funding ratios have declined in 43 states. How dire is the pension funding situation in Minnesota? The sky is not falling. Um, I don't know why uh, the Bloomberg article made it sound like that. This we've known about these, it's called the GASB standards. It's just a different accounting system. And simply put, instead of using what our real interest rate has been over the past 5, 10, 20, 30 years, which has been between 7.5% and 9%, depending on what span of time you're looking at, they assumed that we would be using government bonds, which are very low interest rates. And so then they took the average of what our real interest rate is and what the government bond rate is, which is about 1.5%, and our percentage of about 8%, and they average that out. So then everyone looks less funded. That's all it is, and it's a snapshot in time. And of course, there's no way to really know what the future returns will be. So is this perhaps a, a better way of looking well, at the picture? There, um, I think it makes it look more, it just makes it look more serious than it is. And the problem with that is 
if you pump, if you say we have to pump a lot of more money into our pension systems, then current employees may be paying more than their fair share. Or if you say we have to drastically cut our retirement benefits by cutting the cost of living, then you're really not being fair to the retirees. So it is a balancing act, and we're always looking at it and making more changes, but really nothing on the ground has changed. Okay, well the Pension Committee met recently. Mm -hmm. What needs to be done? What did you learn? How quickly does it need to be done? Well, uh, we certainly learned that we should have passed the last two pension bills and the governor should have signed them. And we passed them, but the governor vetoed them. And I can't blame the governor totally. There was some lack of communication and there were some things the governor said, if you put this poison pill in with the pension bill, I've already promised I'm going to veto this, local interference provision. Um, the leadership should not have mixed the two issues. So that's a problem. We do need to act this year because we do need to make changes. About every five or six years, we need to make readjustment. We have two things that are happening. One is the demographics, is that women in particular are living longer, so that raises our future pension well, costs. Well, and Minnesota's actually number two in the nation for longevity, I read. That's right. Yes. So that's the good news and the bad news, depending <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> what job you're in. And the other issue is what people sometimes call the new normal is that perhaps in the future we shouldn't be so optimistic about what our interest rate is going to be. It has been around 8, 8.5%. So we do need look to lower that assumption to 7.5%, and that should take care of it. And so that's my next question. The legislation last mm -hmm. session, had it been passed, would have lowered the investment return assumption to 7.5%, which is about a 1% reduction. Is that a big enough reduction, or do you think maybe 7% just to be safe? I think that's a big enough reduction for now. Doesn't mean we don't look again in five years to see if that's still the correct assumption. But what that means, though, is because it does make our plans look less funded, that then we need to raise um, contribution rates by employees and raise contribution rates by employers. And we do need to cut back on the cost of living increase for retirees. I call it the shared pain proposal. Okay. Uh, you referred to this just a minute ago, uh, this wave of people that are going into retirement. Will the pension fund be able to handle all of these baby boomers as they transition into this next phase of their life? And then after they're through, the generations that follow, will can this be handled? Yeah, the actuaries take that into account. That's why we're making the changes now, because of the demographics of more people retiring and more people um, uh, being retired and living longer. That's all taken into account in the calculations by very smart people. I couldn't do it. And uh, then they figure out how much we need in order to make sure that we're moving toward full funding. We're on an upward trajectory. Right now we're on an even or downward trajectory with our major pension funds. So we need to be on an upward so that we can say in 30 years we would be fully funded. It's to think of it, Shannon, like, um, like buying a house, right? You don't, uh, the bank's not going to tell you you have to pay off your mortgage tomorrow. That's, we're not going to do that. You pay interest and you pay on the principal and you'll pay off your mortgage in 20 years or in 30 years. That's what it is. Our pension funds have to make sure that we'll be able to pay off our mortgages mm -hmm. in 20 or 30 years. What depending is, on, you, you can pick a different number. In, in your view, what is the right percentage that, that these future obligations should be funded? Like last year, was it 80%? This year, according to Bloomberg, it's 53%. But should it be fully funded, or is 80% a comfortable area to really be able to guarantee those obligations into the future? All the funds need to be on the path to 100% funding. That um, we, mo we don't necessarily need to make it to 100% funding. The problem with 100% funding, it's happened in the past, we've been 110% funded, is then the demand um, is intensified about uh, reducing money going into the pension fund by the employers, the school districts, or the state government or local government, and giving better benefits to employees, um, and maybe increasing the COLA. So everybody wants to get a bigger piece of the pie or have to pay less. Um, if that's the case. And that can harm us down the road because the stock market could take a downward turn, we could go into a recession, and all of a sudden we don't have enough money. So it's better to be safe and to be cautious in that sense. And, you know, if we get to be 80 to 90 percent funded, I'm happy with that. A philosophical question for mm -hmm. you. Is the idea of defined benefit plans archaic and in need of phasing out, or is it something that should be around for the long term, especially for public employees. It's the best retirement plan. It's in a sense like Social Security. You're going to get it. You're going to get the money. 
um, regardless of what happens, regardless of what the stock market does. You know, if you have an individual IRA, you could, right before you retire, the stock market could take a drop and you lose all your retirement funds. It's not very guaranteed. That's why they tell people when you're close to retirement, you need to put your money into safer like bonds or the bank account or whatever and not have it in the stock market anymore. But with a defined benefit plan, it is, it is there for you regardless. So it's the best plan. And um, we did look a few years ago, about five years ago, at going to defined contribution plans. The transitional costs are billions of dollars because the defined benefit plan is really dependent on new money constantly coming into the system. Once you cut that off and you have a closed plan, then that's when your plans go broke. Finally, you were recently a guest on Tom Weber's Minnesota Public Radio News program uh, on the topic of pensions. Near the end, you projected a 50-50% chance that these pension issues will get resolved in the next session. What's preventing action? Well, I think it's, it's political. I think in the past, the Pension Commission has been bipartisan, and we've agreed on what needs to be done, and we need to do the right thing for our public employees. And for some reason, the House leadership has decided that tying pension funds with other issues that they want to get passed is um, a good strategy. And the governor has his priorities. He has like five or six issues that are his priorities ahead of pensions. It's just not his priority. It's the right thing to do. And his commissioner will tell, uh, his, a budget management commissioner will tell him that in terms of, of our bond rating, we need to make sure our pensions are funded, and it's the right thing to do for our government employees. But we shouldn't be playing politics with it, and that's my concern. And if that continues, that's why I said there's a 50-50 chance, because if the plain politics continues, if for some reason we don't have enough money, because it does cost quite a bit, we need to give the school districts money, state government needs to have money, and next year we may need to help out local governments as well when, when uh, PERA comes in for a, a, uh, a fix on their plan. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to get back to the situation in the Pension Commission where we agreed that we had to spend this money and we had bipartisan consensus to do it. Senator Pappas, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for the great questions, Janet. Thanks. The iconic Golden Horses atop the Minnesota State Capitol represent the aspirations of the state at the turn of the 20th century. Brian Pease of the Minnesota Historical Society explains the significance of the sculpture and the ongoing efforts to maintain it. One of the most remarkable features of the Minnesota State Capitol is the quadriga, also known as the Golden Horses. What does it symbolize? It's called the Progress of the State. That's its official title, and it really represents the idea of Minnesota's arrival as a very prosperous and progressive and wealthy state. So when you look at the symbolism, um, it's a large chariot being pulled by four horses, and each of the horses represent powers of nature. So you have earth, wind, fire, and water, there are two women holding the bridles, and so they represent agriculture and industry, and together that represents civilization. So instead of just having the chariot running forward out of control, you have these women holding the bridles so they can use the powers of nature. So earth, you can use that for agriculture, and you can use the water for water power, as they were in 1900 for the waterfalls at St. Anthony to produce all those flower uh, barrels and flour that was supplied all over the world. And so now what you have is this state that's always progressing, moving forward, and because of that progress, you have prosperity. And so the man on top represents prosperity. So he has a horn of plenty in one arm that has produce, corn, wheat, everything that we produce in the state. The other hand, he has a standard that says Minnesota on it. How did this come to be a part of the state capitol? What was Cass Gilbert's inspiration? This was really a, a something not unique. Uh, to the Minnesota State Capitol, uh, as many young architects and uh, politicians, citizens all over the United States flocked to the World's Fair in Chicago in 1893. That was often called the White City because they're trying to recreate these Italian Renaissance buildings which were made of white marble back in Italy in the, re in the Renaissance period. So they, uh, as a young architect, Gilbert saw a statue very similar to this one done by the same artist, Daniel Chester French. He, he saw that at the World's Fair and so like any young architect, he's putting seeds of 
ideas into his mind. And so when he was given this commission, he thought that would be a very appropriate symbol of progress that he could put onto our state capitol. So this is all part of the original design, but it was really influenced by not only the World's Fair, but this was something that you might have seen in Europe, too. And he did travel through Europe as a young man as well. To your knowledge, are there any other state capitals that have such a prominent feature like our quadriga? No, we're the only state capital that does have a prominent quadriga statuary like this. There, I believe Pennsylvania was another state that had looked at doing that, and so uh, that never did happen. So we have that distinction of being the one and only state capital with this quadriga or this large four-horse statuary group. Now, you mentioned gold leaf, and I understand that, that all of the goldness on that is from gold leaf, and our Minnesota climate is, is not friendly to such delicacy. So how often does it have to be redone, and what's the process, and when was it last redone? Yeah, it's about every 10 years you have to reapply a new layer of gold leaf. And what happens is, and in particular with this statue, it's, it's a, a copper statue. So the horses, the figures are all hollow, hammered copper sheets and uh, the wheels and the chariot are made of sheet metal. And so what they do is they put a, an adhesive, first they put a primer on top of the copper and then they put an adhesive, which is called a sizing, and then they apply the gold leaf to that sizing and that's how it, it fixes itself to the statue. But a, as you get, you know, dust storms, the, you know, there's abrasion that takes place, hail will uh, nick and chip away some of that gold leaf. So. Um, every 20 years you pretty much have to replace that gold leaf. And what we've done in the past is we have had a conservator come here every year to do some touch-up as needed. But it's uh, you know, one of those things that's a, a pretty important thing to do because you, there's so much of the artisanship that's involved so you want to you know, do the best job possible. In the 1940s it was done, in 1979 it was done. 1994 uh, it was actually physically taken off the roof for a complete restoration. And so they uh, took apart every statue, put new support systems inside the horses and the man and the women uh, statues and so forth. And then it came back in 1995. And then recently with the, the capital restoration, they had to repair the roof underneath where the statuary sits. And so that came down this, uh, in 2016. And then once again, had a new layer of gold leaf applied to it. So once uh, again, we're seeing it pretty much as it would have appeared when it was first here in 1906. How popular is the Quadriga on the Minnesota State Historical Society tours? It's uh, always one of the big questions we get at the Information Center is, are we going to see the horses or can I see the gold horses? And it's uh, something, a staple that we do for every tour. So on a beautiful summer day, spring, fall day, uh, we take every tour group up here to see that. And, it's, and, and as we mentioned, it's an iconic image and it's something that when you see it up close, it really is pretty it's pretty substantial. It's a lot larger than you see from below and it really is impressive to see that beautiful gold leaf especially with the sun hitting it and really makes it shine and really give you a sense of the power and majesty of that statuary. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.